It was very difficult to decide where to begin with a video talking about Australia, but ultimately I decided for the somewhat problematic start of First Contact, since it's one of the key moments that finds itself reinscribed again and again into Australian literature. First Contact is often something we think about in a science fiction context. When a human species makes contact with an alien one for the first time, Similarly, first contact between different peoples is also described, and it features with it the same kind of exclusionist premise. That is, that this is the first time such different things, different beings, have come into contact. In so doing, the others met are frequently reduced and stripped of some of their human qualities, rendered animalistic or otherworldly. The first contact between Australian Aboriginal peoples and the West is somewhat difficult to pin down for a variety of reasons, and Captain Cook wasn't even the first person, let alone Englishman, to reach Australia. That would be William Dampier, a rather famous pirate explorer. In Dampier's account, he referred to the Aboriginal Australians as the miserablest people in the world, which may have tinged some of the perceptions that Cook and his crew had upon arriving. Regardless, Cook's first contact is perhaps among the most famous due to the sheer popularity of the publications of his accounts at sea. When his crew first reached the shore in 1770, they did interact with Aboriginal people, the Gugu Yimithir, to the point where an altercation even occurred, which was ultimately resolved by an old Aboriginal man. As such, the overall exchange was more or less nonviolent in comparison to what was to come which is perhaps why the Gugu Yimuthir people celebrate the landing and reenact it to this day, as they have since 1959. A painting by one of the members aboard one of Cook's expeditions rendered the scene of contact, and there wasn't only negativity associated with Cook's arrival. As written in logs from, exped from the expedition itself, we found these people civil and good-natured when not prompted by jealousy to contrary a conduct a conduct one cannot blame them for when one considers the light in which they must look upon us. It's impossible for them to know our real design. We enter their ports without their daring to make opposition. We attempt to land in a peaceable manner. If this succeeds, it's well. If not, we land nevertheless and maintain the footing we thus got by the superiority of our firearms. In what other light can they look at first look upon us but as invaders of their country? Time and some acquaintance with us can only convince them of their mistake. Yet Cook's practices of employing firearms all too easily in their encounters with natives, as well as the urgency with which he renamed and thus controlled the landscapes he encountered, tell us a different story. Accompanying maps can also be seen as tools of control as they impose new names. Accompanying maps can also be seen as tools of control as they impose new names upon territories already inhabited by other people and also allow the explorers to control the area through fixing their new knowledge of it on paper. One of the other connections to colonialism in regards to Cook's voyages were the scientists he brought along in order to gather and collect samples, as well as their nautical technology and measurements made during the expeditions. In general, the large amount of scientific discoveries, especially the vast quantity of botanical samples, that were brought back to Europe after their voyages led to increased attention and focus on the capacity for relatively unknown lands to provide fonts of knowledge for the so-called mother country, especially in that field of botany. Again, we can see an ambivalence here, though. Scientific progress is not bad or colonizing per se, but it can and did lead to a misuse of science to control the other, to define Aboriginal Australians as part of the flora and fauna. In your own text, perhaps there's some kind of reference or scene that enacts this first contact. Consider it and how it might relate to what I've said so far. We are perhaps already familiar with what happens next in this story, one that has already happened years before in many lands. The British colonized Australia, although this time there was one significant difference. Australia functioned primarily as a penal colony or a prison colony, where convicted criminals from Great Britain would be shipped and put to work. From 1788 to 1840, 
Australia functioned mainly in this way, housing large military garrisons and the convicts. As the convicts served out their sentences, they would be given freedom. That's not to say, though, that there were not regular settlers who came to Australia as well, only that during this time, they were not the primary population of colonizers, nor the main focus of the colonial project. And things grew greatly worse from that moment on. Infectious diseases, violent confrontations between colonizer and colonized, and the settler acquisition of native lands led to the rapid destruction of the indigenous population. There are estimates of the actual damages, but they're really difficult to make. Writers like Harris have made the claim that some figures show a decline of 96% in the Aboriginal population from 1788 to 1850, during this period roughly. As many Aboriginal tribes frequently engaged in complex movements across the land, they ended up spreading the virus with them. But it's also important to note that the way they moved, that they traveled across the land, was also connected to their stewardship over it, their kind of ownership, not the kind of ownership as the English recognized, but a different kind. For example, Aboriginal Australians would use controlled burns to drive game onto fields, and the process of travel was also a spiritually motivated one, which we'll get to in a bit. As the penal colonies grew, and more and more of the convicts were released from their internment, the amount of settlements increased, and settlers came for other, more economic reasons. The overall justification for the mass movement of colonists shifted from military and as an internal solution to the prison system into a full-blown colonial project, one focused primarily in settling Australia. How was this colonization justified and authorized? In general, there always needed to be some kind of argument to justify colonization. Why else would people move to other countries unless there was some form of perspective or opportunity while the United States and Canada may have been referred to as lands of plenty and the New World, such broader ideological claims weren't at stake in the case of Australia. Instead, they relied on another claim, that of terra nullius. Terra nullius means nobody's land in Latin. Terra nullius is used as a way to justify claims that territory may be taken over or claimed by states when they occupy the territory. Terra nullius has been applied to areas like Antarctica for that reason before. In effect, we could argue that if the moon was terra nullius, then the USA planting a flag there in 1969 might have been understood as a kind of justified and legal claim to the land. Terra nullius was a void, an empty space to be colored in and filled by cartographers or explorers and then occupied by conquistadors and colonizers. That same tempting lure was used to draw colonists to Australia while discarding the Aboriginal people's existence altogether. But by denying that any nations, peoples, and so on lived in Australia, they argued then that it was empty and that it was ripe for the taking. What is perhaps surprising and maybe even alarming to many of you, is that the practice of referring to Australia as terra nullius, which was used to justify the revocation of the claim Aboriginal peoples had on their land, wasn't officially undone until the establishment of native title laws in the 1990s as a result of the Mabo decision. The Native Title Act of 1993 elaborated and provided further legislative explanation for what native title could constitute, and by doing so, it did ultimately end terra nullius. More on that in a bit. A feature that is deeply interesting to not just literary scholars, but anthropologists, students of history, etc., are the so-called songlines and the notion of dream time. Talking about songlines and dream time can be very difficult because of the many divergences and differences between distinct Aboriginal countries and peoples. So keep that in mind and recognize that what I say here should be taken generally with a grain of salt, but that more specific evidence and information can overrule what I say. I say country is here to emphasize the connection and relationship to the land over, say, a word like tribes, which is more filial. According to Aboriginal epistemologies, great spirit ancestors created landscape, plants, and animals on their journeys across the land during dream time, sometimes called everyone. It has many different translations. <laughs> 
and it was the Aboriginal Australians' responsibility to recreate these journeys in order to take care of their country. Before the arrival of the Europeans, different groups of Aboriginal peoples in Australia followed the teaching of their own ancestors. Their distinct identities and cultures were based in large part on elaborate journeys, following the tracks inaugurated by the movement of their ancestors to take care of their own country, according to Fu. And by traveling these lands, they needed to navigate and recognize landmarks to facilitate travel. Rather than using cartography, the Aboriginal Australian peoples used oral storytelling in the form of recitations or songs to record the journey throughout the land. These songs would reflect what were called song lines, or the dreaming track, which carried and still do bear spiritual and historical significance. These interwoven songs could be connected across vast distances, and even across different languages, sometimes between six and all the way up to ten. How are they spiritually significant, though? The song lines were said to be connected to the original dreaming, as mentioned before, and a kind of singing of the world into existence. So in effect, by singing the song along the song lines, Aboriginal peoples were reconstituting, reifying, redreaming, and maintaining the world around them. From their epistemological perspective, an active settlement of non-travel would be akin to destroying the natural world. In some cases, it is also almost a kind of fertility ritual, as new life could not be created without the travels along the song lines occurring. The songs also carry with them the history of Aboriginal peoples, spanning across many generations. In fact, there are parts of the dreaming process which refer back to floods that happened thousands of years ago. In this way, it's worth noting that these were not just orienting and spiritual in their function, but they were historical and cultural too. When Aboriginal people were no longer able to freely travel due to the settlement of their lands, the diseases that ravaged them, and frankly the military presence of the colonizers, they also lost their ability to walk along the song lines, and so parts of their history were erased, possibly forever. The phrase stolen generations refers to the kidnapping and forced institutionalization, usually within government agencies and or church missions, of Aboriginal children, especially those with mixed-race heritage, also called half-castes in some cases. And this was done as an assimilative practice. It was an inherently racist educational effort that impacted somewhere between 10 to 33 percent of all Aboriginal children from around 1900 to 1970. And you'd be really surprised then, right? We've been talking up to this point about basically up to 1850. So if we jump all the way up the head to 1900, which is when a lot more autonomy occurs for Australia, it's actually during this period that the Stolen Generations practice begins. And the practice is one that obviously still impacts a lot of people today because it didn't actually even end until around 1970. It definitely served as a kind of cultural genocide, stripping Aboriginal culture from people by forcing them into new cultural environments that displace their roots. How could they, for instance, do any kind of dreaming or follow the song lines if they were moved halfway across the country into a place where their song no longer made any sense. More importantly, perhaps, though, the children were torn and separated from their families, and in some cases they were never able to reunite, either with their people or with their families. Since the stolen generations, well, since the government targeted mainly children of mixed heritage, it restricted and curbed the Aboriginal Australian population's ability to grow, and it sowed cultural and racial rifts between people. In many cases, hybridity can be a positive starting ground for bringing people together, families able to put their differences aside and create something new, but because of the stolen generation's practices, this was not the case. And What's really quite sad, and riles me up personally, is that it wasn't even until 2008 that the Australian government even offered an apology for all of the victims of this horrific process. Australian Federation was present in Australian discourse even before the penal colony period really came to a close, and this is before the Stolen Generations happens as well. 
And when I talk about federation, I mean the unity of several independent states under a federal government. However, even though it was something talked about and discussed, perhaps inspired by the federations of the U.S. and Canada, it didn't rapidly materialize. Australia, both as a penal and settler colony, formed a total of six distinct, all-self-governing colonies by the time federation did come to happen in 1901. Those colonies were Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, Western Australia, and New South Wales. Oh, and Queensland, too. I totally forgot about that one. <laughs> you see, as Australia grew older, more and more people were born in Australia who didn't hold the same attachment to European or other identities that older generations had brought with them. Since almost all the settlers were migrants, they had a lot more division amongst them. But as time went on, more and more of them started to identify as Australian. And so with that came additional national support for a federalization movement. And so, eventually, by 1901, Sir Edmund Barton became the first Prime Minister of Australia because federalization was successful. I'm not going to get into the details of that process because I don't think they're too relevant. Later on, as a gradual process, decolonization occurred. First, during World War II, the Statute Act of Westminster Adoption Act of 1942 was formally adopted, which relinquished British imperial authority over the self-governing areas of the empire, the dominions. This was basically a formality in some ways at this point, but it made it a lot more explicit that Australia was a nation in ways that was not always so clear before. However, that wasn't really far enough because even at this point, there would remain questions about whether or not parliamentary enactments from Britain could still affect Australia. And so as time went on in the 1980s, a lot of Commonwealth nations started negotiating and changing how they related to the United Kingdom and the British Empire. As such, in 1986, the Australia Act was passed both in Australia and the UK to release Australia and declare it as a sovereign, independent, and federal nation. That's because up until this point, Australia was considered a sovereign and independent nation, but it was also considered part of the British Empire. So when they were signing certain documents, for example, in World War I, when they signed the Treaty of Versailles, they actually signed underneath the British Empire, rather than as their own specific nation. I already mentioned the Mabo decision way back near the beginning of this whole talk, when I touched on Terra Nullius. But we've got to return to the Mabo decision to get a better idea of what it is, because it matters a whole bunch too. The Mabo decision was concerned mainly with native title laws and refers to the case Mabo versus Queensland, number two. In this case, Eddie Mabo, an Aboriginal Australian man who held from the Torres Strait Islands, ended up making his biggest case. Usually when people refer to the Mabo decision or the Mabo case, they just call it Mabo. But here I'll probably call it a whole bunch of different things. We'll see. So as some background, it's worth noting that it wasn't even until 1967 that Aboriginal people were recognized by the Australian Constitution and given its protections. So when Mabo brought forth his case in 1992, the denial of Aboriginal people as even being people at all was still in living memory. So in the case, Eddie Mabo, and fellow plaintiffs demanded that the Merriam people ought to be given the property rights of their ancestors in the Murr or Murray Islands, as they were the people entitled to possess the land, according to their older ancestral claims. The counter-argument, though, which was dictated from the state of Queensland, centered around the notion that English law had been inherited even after decolonization, and the state maintained ownership over the land as the English imperial crown had done so before. However, the official judgment ruled in favor of Mabo, which meant that native title was to be recognized as common law for the first time ever. Although it also entrusted the power of extinguishing native title within the government's powers, so long as the exercise of government authority conflicted with an attempt to establish said native title. So, for example, 
if someone tried to make a broader claim over very specific instrumental properties that the government was using, they would be able to terminate that attempt to establish native title. There would also come a whole lot of other rules as time would go on to explain how a native title could be made, and we'll, we'll catch on that in a moment. It's important to note that the judgment also specified that Aboriginal Australians, even if able to gain their native titles and legally regain their claims, would ultimately still be subject to the Australian government. They would in no way be independent, since the so-called radical title of Australia remained in effect. That is, that the Imperial Crown had claimed all of Australia, and so too, thus could the Commonwealth of Australia. The judgment also rejected Terra Nullius on the official level, which I did mention before, establishing that the native population of Australia did have their own legal status, customs, and traditions that dictated their own ownership of the land, among other things. One that existed before even their acknowledgement in 1967. But of course, there's still a lot of debate around what goes on with Mabo and native title, because proving that you have the capacity to gain a native title remains a huge issue, even to this day. I hope that's given you a little bit of information in better understanding some of the key points of Australian history. This video was originally made when considering Swan Lake by Alexis Wright, which touches on a lot of these issues. But in general, this video can apply to most any kind of Australian literature that connects to any of these major points. A lot of Australian literature is concerned with these topics because they are so significant in how they color the history and the culture of Australia. Thank you very much for watching.